All right. Well, welcome to Inspired Artist Podcast with me, Porter Singer. I am so excited to have Sheila Nichols on the podcast, whom I recently met through a project that we were both part of called The Oracle. And I will read just a little bit of her bio and then we'll get into the discussion with Sheila. So Sheila's, it says on her bio, Sheila's first brush with fame was when she streaked into public consciousness in an act of radical self-exposure. I love this. Live at a Lord's cricket match between England and Australia at the Ashes in 1989, she did naked cartwheels propelling herself onto the front pages of the tabloids in Britain and much of the Commonwealth. It was her first feminist action. She has released three critically acclaimed albums, Brief Strop. Is that how you pronounce it? Brief Strop? Yeah, it's kind of, yeah, I'll get back to that. Yeah, cool. okay. Brief Strop, Wake, and Songs from the Bardo. In each album, smattered between songs of desire and yearning, arousing feminist fantasies, testimonies to the failure of war, commentaries on the ridiculousness of, white, of worldwide chest beating, anthems to the freedom gained, if we just rewrote our collective mythology and the personal eternal journey to rewrite one's own. And I will just say before we begin that what really struck my interest uh, in wanting to talk to Sheila on the podcast was I just randomly selected her out of all these artists that uh, were part of the Oracle project. Uh, I guess, I think I liked your photo. And I, I saw this one song that said, um, Bill Maher, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, which was so great because I've actually had that exact same thought, but I didn't write a song about it. So without further ado, let's get into this. Here we go. Hello. Hello, Sheila. Hi. <laughs> Hi. So um, do you do you want to talk about that song that's like sure, what I you just talked about? Well, let's see, you know, I actually grew up kind of, I actually grew up, I think, pretty much atheist uh, uh, in the sense that uh, I think in England, a lot of people are post-religious in the sense that it's sort of this quaint thing that's sort of like a nice antique. And then when I got to America and I realized that everybody went to church, I was completely gobsmacked. Uh, you know, it's so normative in America to have, like had a childhood in the church and um right. And, and so it was a huge cultural difference, but a lot of Americans have no idea that a lot of Europeans don't go to church in, anymore, or that was my reality anyway. I had, um, so long story short, um, I thought God essentially was a crock of, uh, you know, just where I grew up uh, being, essentially being told that, you know, people need to believe in something that's not real because um, they're insecure and, um, they can't ha they can't they have no other way to discern why the the earth goes around the sun you know essentially uh and of course everybody was really into darwin it's like you know you live you're born you die and you marry somebody you may like a little bit have some kids get fat and you're dead and there's nothing special about you right <laughs> um that's how i lived my life you know um for many many years uh with that personal mythology but unfortunately that personal mythology i think is unsustainable right because um it's it's based in logic in the sense that we're all separate each everybody's an island and just get on with it uh, but it's it denies uh, uh so much of the human experience so um you know everybody has bumps in the road and i hit a pretty big one when i got divorced and big existential crisis and you know the cliche of course is that you is that you know that's when people pray you know but I definitely experienced a part of myself that was just like you know in, in searching in a in a way that I that was beyond language right so um you know I think I had um realized at that point uh, for me that having again lived in America for so long that a part of the colonial minds, a part of um, essentially what colonists did, i.e. British people and European people did, when they went into other worlds, they denied those th their uh, creation stories and they uh, denied their definition of God or their connection to the ephemeral uh, and replaced it, of course, with Christianity and that, that was the only way and all the rest of it. Um, 
And so it started to dawn on me that these connections, because, you know, our Christianity was derivative. It was, it was, it was, yeah, Jesus, ho, oh, have another beer. Right. <laughs> and, um, um, but, but really to ancient cultures and to indigenous people, those connections are real. They're life-giving connections to the, to, to, um, that thing without words, the, the infinite universe, right? So uh, my friend was like, you know, you need to do something. Your story's really boring. I don't want to be your friend anymore if you keep going around in circles with her BS. And I was like, oh, whining, whining. And she was like, you need to go do some work on yourself. And anyway, she directed me to this spiritual center in LA called Agape. And I was like, oh, I know Agape. <laughs> yeah, right. So I was like, no, I don't do church. And then I, and she was like, well, fine. I don't really want to be your friend unless you go handle yourself. So I went to this place and sat there in the back for a couple of years and I was really judgmental and like just look at all these West Coast hippies wearing a sari and thinking they're all spiritual and I was like, you know, la la la. But the problem was there was something going on it was the, that I'd never really listened to or heard before. And basically the message is, look, you're not a victim. You if you if you take care of your the dominion of your mind, right? And and I've been doing a lot of Vipassana meditation anyway, so I understood the idea of objectifying your subjective it's a really long answer to a very short question but it's a, <laughs> like, it's such a it's it took so many years to get to this anyway i'll make it i'll try to wind this up here we go no um, one's trying to re reduce your story you you, you go for it yeah <laughs> so um it's really about you know when you when you meditate you observe you become the eye behind the eye so you start to object objectify your subjective in the sense that you are one of the main first lessons that's taught is that you watch your thoughts come into your mind you don't react or respond and you let them go through and uh, and in by so doing you recognize that there's something else going on behind your thoughts and you're not actually your thoughts even though we all generally speaking identify with our thoughts like our thoughts are who we are and once you get that into place the objectification of the subjective you then um have the experience of being able to to either respond or react to your thoughts so if a terrible thought comes in like you know an old memory or whatever which happens a lot when you're sitting still for many years your ego is just like screw this this is boring let me destroy your brain by making you think of something that's really frightening so you have a reaction when you watch it come into your brain you can make a decision do i you can see it you can say oh look at that look at that thought coming in and then you have a choice to say, do I want to res do I want to let that go? Do I want to do I want to react to it, or do I want to just observe it? And my response is just letting it go, right? There is no response, right? Which then quietens the mind. And as you quieten the mind, you start to have more dominion. And so that's one of the first practices that kind of really started to change things for me. And then, uh, hi, darling. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I have a 15 year old. She just came home. Oh, you're just getting. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. And um, then came the this understanding of oneness, right? Which of course happened. I also did some ayahuasca, which then took that over to another level, which in which you tend, which uh, which is plant medicine, right? And that was profound in the sense that um, what you can I think that that is a, a fundamentally life changing experience, and you you. You, the center is everywhere. You are one with the oneness and the infinite oneness in all directions forever and ever. You know, uh, um, thank God for the West Coast. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, oh, is that where you did the ayahuasca ceremony is on the West Coast? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I've done it twice. Um, uh, yeah. So I haven't gone down to, you know, um, Ecuador or Colombia or Puerto or, or uh, Costa Rica or uh, Peru. All that's Peru, but um, <clears throat> but I think I will because it's such a great teacher. But anyway, it, that led me to the understanding of oneness um, as well, in the sense that there is there's nothing that is not of this thing. You know, I'm still use, I'm avoiding the word God still. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> Baggage on that word, right? Um, as soon as you say that word, people are like, Sora. and the, and they have their ideas of what that means, and then that comes crashing yeah. in. The conversation is then, you know, limited. But if we're if we're able to give it new vocabulary, like you know, 
um, that evolutionary pulse that runs through everything. You know, you try to squash an ant and it will do whatever it can to stay alive, right? So there's mm -hmm. this thing that wants to live, this energetic that, that, that just is, this isness that just <laughs> a, a, a presence as opposed to an absence, a thing that is always. And um, that really sunk in deep when I recognized that uh, there's nothing that is not that. So there's so many of our religions so, uh, and mythologies are like, we're separate from this energy and we're naughty and bad and we have to work hard to get back up to that place. But actually, that's not true. If there's nothing that is not that, if there's just one oneness going on, then there's a part of each person, a kernel that is pristine that through whatever you've been through that that you know whatever abuses that you any you've been through if you want to i believe that there's a part of you that you can appeal to that you can connect with and that you can um bring into the present moment and lean on right um and is a source of strength and a source of um you know self-worth you know all those things that so much of uh, of us all are missing it's a way to it's a it's a way to dervish yourself there's a spiral there with, when you connect that aspect and I needed to because I'm in America by myself no family here and uh you know I need to make sure that I am strong and so this became a powerful lesson and um did did you sorry just as a, a, yeah, a side question did you come to the United States for music was that no was that no the no no, I mean, I, you know, where I grew up, if you said, I want to be a musician and go to Los Angeles, they'd be like, shut up, darling. Don't be stupid. <laughs> You're, don't you sound ridiculous. There's a term for it that it's called tall puppy syndrome. So that means basically, ah, oh, she's thinking above her. She's thinking she could be more than she is. You know, it's not the oh, American tall, tall, right? <laughs> tall puppy, right? So it's not, yeah. so in American, American dream, and you can say, I want to be this. And right. you'd be like, well, that's exciting. Well done. Glad you, you know, they'll affirm it, right? Or I think a lot more in the old countries or certainly where I'm from, that doesn't exist. You have to stay in your station, my girl. You know, don't you dare try and get taller than your station. Don't you know who you are? There's a lot more of that really yeah. Victorian stuff going on. Or there certainly was in my childhood. So you don't aspire. I started writing songs when I was about 11, but I kept them secret because people laughed at me. And then, um, but I had, I just kept writing them. And um, back then I would just sort of write them. And they were very... Um, I, I was doing it for myself because um, it wasn't all, it wasn't a good time, and um, it was the one thing that I really enjoyed about myself in my own company. It was sort of like being my own shrink. But um, um, yeah, I, I got over here and um, hung out with a bunch of folks in Laurel Canyon, and they were like, "Oh, you're a songwriter." I was like, "Don't be silly, dear. Don't be silly." And it took me till I was 25 to go well i better commit to something what have you got what are you gonna do <laughs> oh you got 50 songs oh let's commit to that you know yeah you know, no i didn't i came here because of what happened in england which was like i um i just had enough of my environment where where there were no artists it was extremely mm. mediocre and one day i was just like f this i want to just destroy my reality so i um went to essentially the super bowl of cricket took all my clothes off waited for it to be live on tv across the globe <laughs> and was just like -da! <laughs> um you know sober but with the subconscious intention to um to it but uh bye darling are you going out oh good i'm glad you got your painting sheets painting stuff on so in that respect it was um it was a it was a performance art piece because uh, there was there was very there was so much patriarchy and misogyny when I was growing up. You know, um, mm -hmm. people men would open the door for you, but behind your back you were just a disposable object. And in that respect, I I really grew up with a lot of men being predators, and so I was just mm -hmm. like, and um, and I wanted to just be like, screw you. There was a part of me that was just like knew that I could be really strong, but had no role models or way to get there and so it was kind of a an element of subconscious going on that did, but it was the best thing that ever happened because I was I just ended up coming here never would have done that if if that hadn't have happened because of the because of the attention you got or yeah. because well because of the way my parents processed it and because they people people had seen a naked female and they associated that with sexuality which had nothing to do with mm. and 
um, because, uh, you know, there were some opportunities after that to go on like television and stuff like that. My, my parents locked me in my room and I was just like, I was like, <laughs> it was oh, a and you know, uh, there was a lot of drinking going on, you know, and I, uh, not not so much, well, by me as well, because everybody's drinking, you know, in the late mm-hmm. 80s in, in England, if, you know, uh, um, alcohol, it's a very alcoholic country, you know, uh, drinking is, you know, my mom actually has a pub. So when I go back there, I get, oh, gotcha. I'm not drinking enough because I can't drink as much as them. But yeah, <laughs> that's how I got over here. And um, so yeah, go, well, let's go all the way to the song. So the song is an amalgamation of, of me becoming um, not just post-religious, um, uh, but post-atheist. Bye, mm. sweetheart. Um, and, you know, because, because I'd already gone through the, I don't believe in God at all. And then when I came back to it, it was great because I didn't really have any of the heavy indoctrination that a lot of people have. So I refused to use the word God for about 10 years because I thought it was really offensive. And then finally, when I had this existential breakdown and I just had to go, I, I need a way into this connection that I've denied forever. And I'm a songwriter. I know ethereal moments. I know that something comes from nothing, right? Yeah. Um, and, and so I started to just give it a new vocabulary that worked for me, which is guilt-free, which is not personified. You know, some of the time, you know, God is like an, uh, an old white guy in the sky. None of that crap you know, no original sin, you know, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and I feel like, you know, if we're really going to talk about an in, infinite source, right, it's the good shit. It's, it, it's, you know, it's uh, love and empathy and joy and peace and sweetness and all those things that we all inherently feel as humans as a part of our human experience but we have these economic systems that are all based in competition and fear and all this other shit that's the negative crap right and so um it, i really needed to redefine this word for myself you know god it's a super heavy word it means so many different things right yeah and so i basically had the intention of um creating a song that was uh, a, you know a social commentary um to deconstruct and then reconstruct the concept of god in as it turns out three and a half minutes and so that's what it is all right thanks so much good night cleveland (laughs) (laughs) oh my gosh well so many things went through my head as you were as you were talking about that the first is that it's so funny to me that you were describing brit you know you say the uk or britain i but just this this country that has a monarchy that is literally based on, I mean, the only claim to their um, ability to exist, right, is religion. I mean, they are oh, ordained, tourism, supposedly. Tourism, mate. Tourism. <laughs> sure, but I mean, like, and, at its base, right? Well, you know, that's a facade. I mean, it's always been a facade. Um, but, um, but no, the monarchy, I think, exists for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, the class system in England is still very, very strong. And, um, you know, whereas in, in America, there's a great deal of, you know, issues around race and homophobia. I mean, right, both of those right. things exist all over the place. But right. in England, there's still this sort of weird, intense thing going on with class. And class over in England is not defined by how much money you make. It's defined by closely blood related you are to the queen, right, essentially. Right. So um, that whole thing is, is, is creates the separation uh, caste system that's you know certainly not as bad as it used to be but it's certainly not over so i think right um, but i mean that whole system is based on the concept that god has decided that certain people are basically (laughs) above others right (laughs) interesting um yeah so and then i was also thinking about like all these people in england having nothing to do with the religion that they've spread everywhere (laughs) i know it's it's just ridiculous it's insulting uh, it's yeah. bonkers no right i mean it's time for see the thing is it's so important it's so time for us to have a real connection um with the planet right with the with with our actions like we we behave like we're these with the, like we're separate from nature and we are yeah. not you know right. um so for me this you know honestly spirituality uh, and it's so unpopular with, with the people that I know, you know, my family are like, you, you believe in God, dear? You know, <laughs> you know, and I have, I, I don't even bother trying to find anything. I'm like, yeah. And, 
<laughs> because it's my definition of God and what works for me. And it doesn't, um, I don't care what your God is or what your, right. or you even whatever you want, but this works for me because it allows me to, and I hope it works for some people because I think it's time that we redefine that connection. So for me, it's not anything to do with guilt and shame. Right. You know, okay. those are um, really antiquated, uh, dogmatic concepts of a, a total bullshit concept of God. Because if we're talking about God, we're talking about something that is infinite. We're talking mm -hmm. about something that is, um, um, you know, as soon as you start to define it in our tiny anthropomorphic perspective, it's no longer God because God okay. is under definition because it's so massively, infinitely, whatever, you know, it's beyond our vocabulary. It doesn't mean we say we can't try to describe it, but we need to do better. Yeah. Uh, no, hey, this is this is me. This is me trying to get you to talk. That's the whole point here. So we're okay. we're, we're doing really well. Um, <laughs> you know, I it's interesting because there's there's like there's definitely that American thing where when you say or when people say God, you sort of assume that they mean well, they're either like a Jewish God or a Christian God or whatever. But it has like a whole story around it, right? My brother, my brother, my son mentioned Jesus in the bathtub last night because I guess he heard it on some YouTube video or whatever. And his background is more like Eastern religion. He's been around a lot of Sikhism. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I asked him, I was like, you know, it's interesting. I bet you don't know this, but there are people who believe that the only way you can uh, be, or that they, they believe that you have to believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior or whatever. I don't even think I said that, but that Jesus Christ is the specific thing or you're going to go to hell. And he was like, he looked at me like, no. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, I love his response. It's the perfect <laughs> response. What are you talking about? That's so dumb. <laughs> that's so great. Yeah. That's so crazy that people think that it's, yeah. It's like, I know. Yeah. Tragic, really. It's tragic. I mean, people have to recover from that crap, you know? I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's really tragic. I mean, we, you know, it, it's really important that we um, prioritize the timeless qualities of being human. You know, how, how we've got so many people who are dealing with depression and anxiety. And it's like, I feel like, you know, if we were able to, and I don't, this might sound idealistic, but I truly honestly think it's about survival of the species. We must focus on, as I said, the timeless qualities of joy and peace and love and sweetness and kindness. Those are the things that are yeah. going to create those connections between each other to create the movements that we need to be able to move forward. You know, there's so much division. Yeah. Yeah. I was, so just to pivot a little bit, I was reading also in your bio, I did a little bit of research before. I don't usually do this. So I got a little opportunity to read your um, stuff, but I was reading about your song being in the High Fidelity soundtrack, which, so I didn't really know. I literally just, I was like, oh, this is a really cool song. Let me contact Sheila, um, the Bill Maher one. So I, I had no idea about your, uh, your cool sync. Um, yeah, that was cool. Sense, which is kind of cool. Well, but that's just a codependent love song. I mean, it's a pretty well-written one, but it's still a codependent love song. I've tried to move on from uh, that kind of lyric. <laughs> I gotcha. Okay. So when you first, so when you were first writing or when you were first starting songwriting, you were saying it's a form of therapy or whatever. And um, was it like a lot of relationship songs? Is that kind of what you're doing? No, it was, um, well, when I was really young, um, it was, uh, it was tapping into, um, cause the lyrics always been really important to me and the lyric can define the melody a lot of the time. Um, it was really about having a, a, no one to talk to about what was going on in my brain. So it was like mm. that. And, and, and a lot of the songs were pretty ephemeral uh, about uh, like rivers and nature and, um, and uh, in metaphors around feeling those in feeling nature in myself. And so it was already kind of in that space, but that oh, okay. was way too like, weird for for people where, where I was growing up so I just made it did it for myself um and then as I got older it certainly became about um about relationships most definitely I've got a lot of those um for sure and uh that's that's a lot of that going on in my first record um uh you know, a bit a lot of self inquiry as well. Like a lot of some of the songs are like, mm, I don't know if you want to come too close to this. <laughs> you know, it's like lots of those, few of those. But <laughs> a bunch of 
songs too, you know, because I'm pretty sure that the, the spirituality, the spirit, the spirituality is 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 also um, political as well. So I'm a, definitely a political activist, and I think, um, you know, calling out patriarchy, calling out um, um, the 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 misogyny and the mythology, you know, um, because so much of my life has been about um, uh, cre trying to create relationships that are healthy after coming from an alcoholic uh, mm. father that pretty much screwed whatever he wanted, you know, and treated and taught me that men were predatory, which mm. they're not all predatory, but that's what I uh, was attracting because that's what I was used to. And that is, that is uh, suicidal, right? So pushing, so trying to morph that, um, and 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 also uh, just dealing with aspects of abuse. A lot of that goes in too, uh, lyrically. You know, um, you know, I've got Medusa's a song about a, a female Moses. You know, um, um, you know, or um, just you know, talking about fake uh, girl power. You know, um, you know, or. I think because, you know, the, the big final frontier of duality is um, the way that the feminine is treated. You know, we rape the planet. Uh, mm. It has everything to do with how we treat the feminine, okay. I think. Um, and so when we have respect for our mothers and respect for our sisters and we stop violation and child slavery, you know, which is still totally undealt with. And, and it's still so much the time hard to, for people to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Roe versus Wade, uh, you know, she was dressed provocatively, so the rape is her fault or, uh, you know, uh, you know, whatever, you know, and I know that that stuff is still yeah. systemic and pervasive. Um, and, um, you know, until, until that inequality is over, um, I think that, you know, the, the humans are going to have a hard time evolving into something sustainable. And we're really at that precipice right now. How are we going to, yeah. you know, we're not on a good trajectory as a species, right? Right, right. That's, yeah. It's very, it's very interesting how people, that, that argument too about, you know, the, I, I remember being in a, in a grocery store line, actually. I grew up in France. There was so oh, much yeah. misogyny. Mm -hmm. um, Especially there's a lot of, you know, and this is, this is, it, th there's a lot of people who come from North Africa and mm -hmm. they have very, also like a very misogynistic, but in a, even like a different way. So there was from both of those, from like the French cultural and the, the Islamic kind of cultural, there was like a lot of misogyny, but I remember being in this line um at the grocery store once and some man was looking at a magazine cover and he turns to me and he's like and women and women wonder why they get raped <laughs> he literally just turned to me and said this and i was like and what? actually it was interesting because the first thing that i thought and i was like a middle schooler maybe but i didn't say it but the first thing i thought i was like i feel like P i feel like women have gotten raped throughout the ages and they were pretty long dresses <laughs> you know? yeah but yeah with that but to do with the need to dominate and yeah. um and this is the thing right so we're still living by you know the rules that a bunch of essentially sort of 17th century old white guys came up with in europe you know yeah. and it's all about domination and, and that's based on insecurity right it's a it's a misconception it's like you don't have to dominate women in order to make yourself feel better or but right. that's that's the animal thing that's still going on you know we and you know the need for that kind of power or that pseudo power, that feeling of power by putting somebody else down is right. um, personal self inquiry, a lack of connection with self, a denial of one's emotional state. You know, it's what boys don't cry and all the other crap and all the definitions of, of masculine. That's another reason. That's another great thing that's going on right now is the disillusion of gender into, mm. into, you know, a, a, a spectrum. And, mm. um, you know, younger people just declaring that that's what's going on. I really, I love that really. Yeah. 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 It is interesting. They, yeah. um, what was I going to say about the male thing? No, I forgot. But yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, I had it. I had a thought and I totally forgot it anyway. Um, yeah. So you have, 
the one child then just one kid yeah that's enough one child okay and you, yeah. so you are literally raising the, the the feminine right now or at least in in this um true <laughs> Yeah, and we're in Los Angeles. It's, it's pretty intense. I mean, but the thing is, again, she's not a she anymore. They are now they. And, oh, um, okay. Yeah, and and I actually, you know, I was a big tomboy, and then when I was fourteen, my dad was like, "Pick a lane." He was like, "You need to wear <laughs> clothes. Don't wear boys' clothes because you're gonna look like a dyke," you know. Okay. And I, and, you know, so I had to pick a lane, and I was, you know, um, I mean, I I was pretty heterosexual anyway, but I was. Uh, you know, but I really didn't like that. Even then the roles that women were forced into, you know, it was yeah. so, unless, you know, it was, it was, it was like, go be a wife. I mean, or, you know, it, it was just limited where it wasn't really, if I'd grown up in London, it wouldn't have probably, I would have probably seen a lot more, but um, provincial Northern Essex was um, my experience was, was uh, there were no role models. There were no artists and women, the women around me were just, um, sort of tittering fools in tweed drinking gin and tonics <laughs> you're so funny <laughs> whatever you know and all the guys would screw each other's wives and everybody it was just a mess it was like you guys it was nothing I wanted to be I can't believe I'm yeah. telling you I don't know why I'm saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's not surprising I reached those conclusions you know I mean you, right. you know if you're gonna walk in the world without going down that path then you have to develop a different way of being and you have to figure out how to do that yourself and that means having this together you know more than anything right so yeah I have definitely taught my daughter about the things that I've experienced but I've also tried to make sure that um, they also know that love is magical and that connections with another person you know, can be a gateway into the divine uh, and uh, that making love is a wonderful, beautiful thing uh, and to be proud of their body and to love the person that they are. And, you know, I always talk about the two wolves, which wolf are you feeding? You know, about that uh, Native American. No, uh, remind me of that. Uh, let me start to remember it. But it's basically like there are two wolves, you know, this this uh, grandfather's talking to the child and says, you know, there are two wolves inside of you. You know, one of them is uh, anger and greed and, you know, all the things. And the other one is joy and happiness. And, and he was like, which wolf are you feeding? Right. So you have a decision to make throughout your life. Like I have a shitty thought right now. Do you want to feed that thought and recreate it in this moment and then this moment and this? No, actually, I don't. I want to like put that shit to rest. And now I'm going to choose to bring something positive into this moment. I mean, it's a spiritual technology, isn't it? It's very basic. It's just like I'm in charge of this moment. The presence is the only thing that we've got. The past and future are not real. I'm only in control of this. What am I putting in it? Right? Which wolf am I feeding? Well, I'm going to choose gratitude or whatever the hell it is to get yourself out of the funk so you don't end up like, you know, half the world, like half my family on antidepressants, right? So there are ways that have worked for me and I'm not suggesting that they, you know, I don't want to say to anybody that's taking pills that they're doing the wrong thing because they're not. Everybody does whatever works for them. But I do think this has been a gift for me to know. And mm -hmm. it's, it's you know, neuroscience, you know, it's, um, um, again, when you know that you have a choice when you embody that in that moment, you can make a new decision about, okay, how's this moment going to go? And then how's this moment going to go? And then how's this moment can go? And that shit can pull you out of acute depression because it did mm. for me. Right. Yeah. And so you just create new sy synaptic pathways in your mind. Right. It takes 17 days to break a habit. Right. <coughs> Joe Dispenza. And you just uh, <laughs> work hard at that and you're going to, and it will eventually um, yield, you know, mm. Kitty. <laughs> you have a piano oh, playing cat? <clears throat> oh, kitty, kitty. I know. What is that? Is that a, is that a little Baroque number? Is that a classical piece of jazz? She got good up here. This piano kitty. Piano kitty plays it piano in the middle of the night. Like, play kitty. Play. Oh, seriously? <laughs> There's no fucking food. <laughs> yeah. oh my gosh i saw the funniest cat book the other day it was like poems by a cat and one of them was like um i i 
I, I see that you're sleeping. I scratch your face. Oh, you're awake. <laughs> yeah, this girl, she's the skinniest, uh, like just scrawniest, like pulls her hair out, nastiest cat ever. But I Ooh. love her. She's, <laughs> she's like, she's just, what? She's fierce. She's a real bitch to her sister. <laughs> She's small and scrawny and like, you know, she scratches Musically herself. expressive. Oh, little girl. Hi, sweetie. I know. <laughs> I love you. Right, can we do this later? Do you mind? Uh, Come on, I'm going to put you down, woman. Here. I love you. You're going down. Thank you. I love I'll the do. piano playing cat. Uh, so are you doing, are you doing any projects now or you said you were mostly momming it? I can relate I, to that. But I have um, a project with Dave Stringer that w is coming out. Oh, fun. November, and we're just about to go to New York. We're going to do um, a, a Wait a, a second. Do you yeah. perform with Dave, with Dave Stringer? Yeah. I've known him for 30 years. I feel like that may be why, because it felt like I, you were familiar to me. I feel like I've seen you live with him. Oh, probably. I probably have. We have a record we just put together, and we're going to – it's up on um, – band camp right now just as a preliminary thing and then oh. you know we um are gonna pop it at omega we're doing this workshop there um coming up and oh, cool. um over labor day weekend and then we're doing um a kirtan workshop there after that um That's which fun. i'm pretty gonna be great and then i've also been hanging out with jennifer johns who's like this lady i know oh, awesome who just is um um a really creative human and we had a great time last night and she's runs the studio like a boss she's all we got like four tracks done last night like bam 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 whoa like, okay, another hour and a half okay you got 12 minutes lay down the vocal she's really good she's really okay. good in the studio like seeing women like get it together in the studio and not go down rabbit holes or second guess things or you know she, she's amazing so that's been yeah. fun that's been really fun um, you know, and, uh, I'm always writing and I think the frontier for me, you know, Dave, Dave has a real thing with Kirtan and I appreciate that. But for me, I'm sort of moving into this sort of, uh, spiritual, but not religious, uh, political, um, because it, it has a lot of crossover for me. Um, lyrically, you know, that's kind of where I'm going. <laughs> Dave was the first person that got me to chant. Okay. He, yeah, I was, so I used to work for a festival called Bhakti Fest. Did you ever go to that? Yeah, no, we performed there. Yeah, yeah. okay, so maybe that's why I have seen you. So yeah. I, I also performed there, but I started out working as their volunteer coordinator, and I was basically like the producer's bitch. That was my job. Okay. And um, at his birthday party, Dave came, <laughs> and suddenly Sridhar, who was the producer, he's like, now Porter's going to lead you in something. And I'm like, I am. <laughs> So I didn't know how to play harmonium. So Dave was like, I'll play for you. Uh, and he's like, tell me what chords you want. And, and so it, we like, we get through like one, at the time I was doing Kundalini yoga mantras. So we get through like one line of Adi Shakti. And he's like, you're going to need to break this down for people. <laughs> it's too long. <laughs> yeah. He's good. He's great. He really has a niche thing that he does. He really brings, um, that freedom to chant to people you know because it's it's kirtan is accessible you know it's not super complex and it's um and it takes you into that trance of just letting go into that slow dervish you know um and it's interactive um and in that respect it's just a great tool you know yeah to not only find you know some some peaceful moments but also just uh bringing people together you know everyone's been so isolated through through covid i love that dave's a great facilitator you know so yeah plug plug the plug the omega workshop i mean i'm really rubbish oh yeah so so what is that yeah labor day weekend is the is the chant fest and then um the uh the following week is um the kirtan workshop that we're doing gotcha. yeah yeah omega Institute, upstate New York. Kind yeah, of no, that's, 
that's on my that's on my list of things that I would uh, love to eventually get to. I've never been, but it seems really cool. Yeah. There you are. You're on the West What's Coast. That? Right? Yeah, no, yeah, I'm the West Coast. I'm in uh, upstate Washington. Upstate? We were just in Port Townsend. Well, I guess that's. I don't need to say upstate. I'm in Washington. <laughs> I was support. We would. I just spent time in Port Townsend. That was just so phenomenal up there. Oh, okay. I haven't. I haven't been to Port Townsend. But Even yeah, though, it's it's just so beautiful. Somewhere near, yeah, it's beautiful up there. It's amazing. Yeah. No, I live near Seattle. So. Oh, you're near Seattle, yeah. 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 It was just um, we just did the Olympic Peninsula, and it was outrageously beautiful. Oh, it's amazing. Really. Just loved yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so lush. That's really cool. So, do you know CC White then? Sure, I've known her for thirty years. Oh wow! Okay, so yeah, she was the first person ever invited me to sing. So that was oh that. God. Yeah, so two like huge, huge people in my in my uh, life. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, Dave, Cece, kind of like you know, Cece had a whole career before Dave. Like she sang right. with some dates. You know, she's had a six octave range. That woman has got a crazy voice, right? It's amazing. Yeah. But yeah. um, you know, but Kirtan. It, you know the west i have to say i think dave is a pivotal person on the west coast kirtan scene like he was really i think the first person that came back and put like la session musicians you mm -hmm. know like bar and like mm -hmm. brought a little like oomph into it you know um because you know there's a lot of kirtan going on that's kind of droll and it's not and it you know, I, I mean, I hate to say that he brought like a like a glossy finish or an LA edge to it, but he lifts that shit up. The crowd, oh, he does, burn. yeah. They, He's amazing live, and that's the point, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So fun, oh yeah. I think CC. A lot of people came up through Dave as well with his whole thing. I mean, he just brought in the community for years. I mean, um, yeah, that was yeah. He's really um, I think a pivotal character on that whole scene. You know. And I'm really glad he didn't change his name to, you know, whatever, Easton. Tree, whatever, like, yeah. Like Dave, and he's like, whatever. And I love, yeah. I love him. he's not pretentious. Yeah. And yeah, totally. Not that it's pretentious. So yeah, I just feel like Dave is just very, oh, yeah. I, I, what, yeah. you, what you see is what you get, you know? Totally. So, it, and you're doing an album with him as well. So is that going to be? That's already out. That's, that's finished. Yeah, that's on uh, that's on Bandcamp right now. You can if you go on Bandcamp, oh, cool. either one of um, our our Bandcamp uh, sites, and it's called Thrum T H R R U M. Thrum, cool. Okay. Yeah, and there's another version of God on there. There's two versions of God. There's one one version where I'm singing it on my album All of Nature just by myself, and the second version is one Dave produced, which is a conversation between me and him. Oh, wait, wait. So God being... Same song. Okay. Same. Oh, sweet. But um, but uh, he changes the name, but it's the same song. Uh, it's still called God, but on my record, it's called A Social Comment. Or it's called um, Bill Maher Dance with Baby After the Bath. And on Dave's record, it's called God, A Social Commentary. Oh, okay. I want to hear this. That's cool. <laughs> all right. I will, um, I'll put links to all this in the uh, podcast description so people can hey. easily click, click on that. But yeah, so we have the Omega thing coming up and then your album that just released. And is there anything else that I should let people know about? Um, well, let's see. Uh, just love and peace and joy and make sure you like <laughs> pull that stuff up and like give that stuff the attention. It's all where we put your attention. Get off the screen. <laughs> <laughs> that I have to do with my kid all the time. That's really, that's all I... <laughs> I have, but I, and I, I'm really grateful for being being with you and being asked to talk about this stuff because I can chatty chat about this stuff forever. You know, it's uh, yeah, you know. But so thanks for for taking the time. Yeah, yeah, for, of course. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to share before we before we go away in terms of like anything on your mind? Not to put you on the spot. You don't have to. But yeah, but it's all right though. I can. I can like, <laughs> um. I think that we are at a very important time in history. And I think that it's really important for people to stay as awake as possible and to be as present as you can and practice to be present and make sure that you're an active participant of what's going on. And, you know, we're really 
dealing with uh, which wolf, you know, there's a lot of people that are just making money and don't really give a shit about the future of the planet or your, or whether our grandchildren can breathe good air and drink clean water. And a lot of people just are thinking about short term. Well, I just want to get mine now. And um, if we don't think from a bigger place, you know, if we don't remember that we're floating on this beautiful jewel this beautiful, this ball of mud, but it's a beautiful jewel that gives life in an infinite space. You know, we need to think about the perspective and how vital it is that we remember all of the shoulders of the people that came before us, all of our ancestors and all of their pains and struggles for us to be here now. Because humanity has a choice. We can either learn to live on this planet in balance and respect for all beings, or the earth is going to have a big period and we're going to be bye bye and that is a choice that we have to make. And it is a choice, you know? And I think a lot of the time people are too disconnected and don't think that they're powerful enough to do anything about it. But it, it, we are powerful enough to do something, especially if everybody bothers to reach inside to that personal kernel of pristine that still exists, that never goes away, that can never be touched because there's nothing that is not God. So that means there's a little tiny speck of that in every single thing not just person but everything every every thing even inanimate objects it was all made by that one presence that one power that one thing that's indescribable non-definable undefinable right by definition but it's real we're here we're conscious and mm. you know i'm just urging folks to even in the hardest times you know to seek that aspect out and bring it to this moment and to this moment and to this moment and find that strength so that your strength is my strength is their strength and that we can create social justice movements that actually get shit done as opposed to break apart because people squabble with each other because they misplace their fear and anger and shame and whatever. We need to get past that shit. We need to be in solidarity with one another and we need to make our future for ourselves, for our children, for all beings, something that we can look forward to and know is going to be actually there, you know, instead of just thinking about ourselves. And I just, I just hope that, um, I really hope that that's where we're headed and that we can bust through this trajectory of us and them and you and me and up and down and black and white and separation. It's bullshit. There's only one going on. There's only one thing going on. And I just implore that we that we find that aspect individually so that we can bring that to the table to do good in the world because that's what we're here to do we're here to be joyful we're here to be happy we're here to be in this eden that we have been given you know and i know that you've been through shit i know that you've been abused i know that some fucked up shit has happened you know and i know that i'm very very lucky in many ways but i'm just saying i do think that that's a possibility if we choose it i guess that's it yeah. Oh. Well, that's a nice note to leave on. So, thank you so much for joining me and um I will uh I will let you know when this comes out. Thank you. Hey, okay, you. Thanks so much. You take care, okay? Bye. Thank you for tuning into the podcast. Please remember to like, rate, subscribe, whatever your service offers you as a way to engage and let others know that you're enjoying it so it gets shared with more people. I have just launched my newest coaching program called Emotional Fluency 101. You can check out the info on that at portersinger.com slash coaching and book your complimentary intro call there so that we can chat and find out if we work well together. For all news updates on what I am doing, you can go to my website, portersinger.com, sign up for my mailing list and get a free track as a thank you. All right, I will see you in the next episode. Bye.